people, you know, you got to kind of strive to skate. It's, it's how it works. And at some point I said to her, I said, you know, are you afraid of falling? And she's like, yeah, <laughs> falling hurts. I'm like, good point. It does hurt. I said, but what if we found a way to fall safe? Right. What if I taught you how to fall? Because you're going to fall. Falling is absolutely part of being a skater, right? Professional skaters do it. Ice skaters do it. They all fall. So if you learn how to fall safely, I'll bet you you'll be more successful in the skating. Of course, um, like last week, hey, can we go to the can we go to Playland? Of course. And they're out there for hours skating and going backwards. I can't do that. Stuff like that. And, and, and so what I loved about that was just the fearlessness uh, because she accepted the fact like falling is part of the game. I'm just going to deal with it. Um, and I think a lot of times you you just mentioned it, Mom. So we we often say, well. This possibility could happen, and look, you and I have yeah. been in situations that have not been pleasant, right? No. Yeah. And we have fallen, maybe unsafely, but we also had a community of people around us to say, "We got your back, and we know who you are." Welcome to Student Affairs Now, the online learning community for student affairs educators. I'm your host, Mamta Akapati. Student Affairs Now is a premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find us at studentaffairsnow.com, on YouTube, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Today's episode is sponsored by Simplicity. A true partner, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life with technology platforms that empower institutions to make data-driven decisions. Stay tuned to the end of the podcast for more information about our sponsor. As I shared earlier, my name is Mumta Akapati. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am broadcasting to you today from Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas is situated on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Humanos, Coahuiltecan, Comanche, Lipan Apache, and Tonkawa peoples. My friends, this is just such a full, full full circle moment. You can't imagine how I'm feeling today. I can't tell you how much I cherish our feature podcast guest. Dr. Richard Reddick is one of the most brilliant, thoughtful, and grounded educators that I know. His abundant spirit and presence is a shining light for me and so many others in his life. Dr. Reddick is a distinguished service professor in educational leadership and policy and senior vice provost for curriculum and Enga enrollment and Dean of Undergraduate Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Some fun facts, Rich is a past champion of Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. Of greatest meaning and purpose though, his most important titles are husband to his wife, Sherry, and dad to his son, Carl, and daughter, Catherine. With that, welcome, Rich. Um, let's begin. I'm just so grateful to have you on the podcast today. Um, I'm really excited. Uh, I'm sure this is going to reveal itself soon, so we might as well just, you know, come out in the open yeah, we should with, just with our own <laughs> long-time friendship. <laughs> but before we go into that, I'm really excited um, that we get to talk about your book um, and your research, really. It's an aggregate of a lot of your research over time. Uh, but your book, I'm holding it here, friends. There we go. Um, Restorative cool. Resistance in Higher Education, Leading in an Era of Racial Awakening and Reckoning. Um, so uh, as we talk about our, our connected story, um, I just want to start with a quote, um, one of my favorite quotes in the book, and this isn't particularly scholarly, this is the me search that you talk about. Um, <laughs> um, diversity and inclusion was, by un was my unofficial undeclared major via activities and involvement on campus. I just love that self-reflection that you shared in, 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 in the opening of the book. Um, but as we get into the book, let's talk about your journey. I know our journeys intersect, but I want to hear about your journey into higher education. Oh, that's that's such a great and and mom, it was hard for me to sit here quietly during the introduction. <laughs> I wanted to say a little smart alky comments as you were talking because oh, we do. are <laughs> such such good friends and such good buddies. We go back so far, um, but uh, it's it's just a joy to be on this podcast with you and, and just to share this space. So, yes, uh, I, I think you know within seconds of knowing me, people know I'm first gen. So I I came to the University of Texas. Uh, my parents uh, um, are great champions of education, but did not go for it in high school. And their dream, of course, for me was to go and pursue my degree without quite knowing what that meant. And, and so from the day I was dropped off in front of the Adobe 
dorm in front of 2021 Guadalupe Street. It's kind of like, okay, you're doing your thing, you know, enjoy it and, you know, let us know if you need help, but you'll figure it out. And, and I actually appreciated that approach they had, which was like, they were never too involved. And at times I thought like, why aren't you more involved with this? But yeah. they basically gave me a chance to grow. And it also forced me to build connections uh, and, and sort of navigate the space. And one thing that the book talks about in that chapter is just the fact that I come from a military family. I, I moved 12 times school, 12 times before I graduated from high school. So I'm very used to sort of having to figure out things. And that would suggest that my work on mentoring was kind of tied to that because I was often the new kid. Mm-hmm. And as a new kid, you have to figure out how systems work. Who are the bullies? Who are the allies? Who are the people who are going to be helpful to you? Who are the people who are going to be detrimental to you? Those kinds of things. Yeah. And so literally the first day I was on campus, I went to an event um, at Clark Field when it was actually a field, uh, literally just a patch of land. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was the welcome program. It just said welcome. I don't know what they were welcoming to, but they had free food. And I went to that program and I think I went to get the free food frequently. And I was very flacco back in those days. I was very skinny uh, to the point I had attracted the attention of the woman running the program. Her name was Brenda Burt. Mm-hmm. And uh, she said, well, you should come back tomorrow. You clearly need a meal, right? Uh, and I came back the next day and I realized this is a place and a person I would connect to. So Brenda Burt, our shared mentor and dear mm-hmm. friend, uh, started that process for me. And I felt my sense of connection to her. And I don't think it's a coincidence that as a black woman, my first encounter at the University of Texas of Substance was with another black, with a, with a black woman. So she ended up being my other mother. She uh, mothered me throughout the university process. I became an orientation advisor and a peer advisor and resident advisor, during which I got to be, had the privilege of being Mampa's RA. Okay, uh, let's, let's be very clear, you know, like if we're going to reveal <laughs> secrets, uh, you were my RA and my neighbor. And yes. um, I, we, we, we met because of noise, right? I believe there was Faith No More, Faith Metallica, no more. Or Metallica or <laughs> Def Leppard or something. So, so yes, I, I credit you for uh, definitely uh, reining me in and shepherding me. <laughs> I got to tell the story, though, because, you know, when you think about people who are noisy, it's not mom and her roommate. These were very, very well-mannered and very scholarly <laughs> students who have like to rock out a little bit uh and so you know usually you think about the guy with the long draggled hair baking his head this wasn't them but they loved them some faith no more as did i um and it was just like hey let's get to a certain point but what's really interesting about that as you're sort of growing and being mentored mm-hmm. yourself you're yeah. starting to recognize the opportunities and potential of others yeah. and you know i i I went to Mantra's room one day and I said, look, you know, we have this orientation advisor program and I'm part of it. You should think about it. And I think you said no yeah. very quickly. I'm pretty sure you said no. But before you came to my room, you you waved the application, you know, back in the days of paper under my door. Like you kept like <laughs> wiggling it under. And you did that a couple of times. So Not subtle yeah. at all, right? No, no subtleties. <laughs> but, and but yeah. and the, the reason why is because, you know, you're a kind soul. And it was very evident to me you were a kind soul. And I'm like, if I want to bring new students to the university, I want them to meet Mopta. I want to meet people like you. I want them to feel connected. And and I saw that in her. And, you know, when you work as an orientation advisor, you spend so much time with each other. You get to know people on a deep level. And I knew you quite well at that point. And I'm like, I would love to know her better as well. So yeah. it was self-serving, but also the fact that I knew you would be an amazing uh, resource and frankly, everything you've done in the, in the field of student affairs, I have taken credit for in some degree. To say, <laughs> well, look at what Mamta has done; she's so amazing. And then now we have the experience of having shared mentees yes, or shared yes. people who work. Uh-huh. Justin Samuels, a person that's in mind. Oh, you know, yeah. Justin. Um, you know, when he first had him in my class, he would gush about Dr. Akapati, and I'm like, you mean Mamta? You know? <laughs> And then he was blown away, like, you know each other. I'm like, yes, we know each other very well. And so I, I, that's a huge joy, I think, for both of us, just to know that Absolutely. we've been in the field enough, long enough to see um, folks who are looking to us for inspiration. And they're inspiring others as well. Yeah. So full well, circle, indeed. It's full circle. And, you know, we know we knew each other well. And then there were things that uh, certainly we didn't know. Like, you know, I hear about your first gender. And, I, you know, certainly I knew components of that. But what you don't know is that that orientation advisor invitation 
saved me. I was really struggling in school. I was yeah. alone. Uh, there was a lot of cultural, right? Um, first gen adjacent myself um, mm-hmm. in, in many ways. Like I did not have ways to talk about what I was experiencing. And if not for that orientation intervention, I don't know where I would be, right? So you literally, yeah. you retained me as a student, as a as a, as a a mentor. So uh, it was much more powerful than I, I mean, we, we laugh about it, but let's honor, let's hold sacred. Yeah that you saved me as a person. And so I want to really publicly recognize you for that too. And that was true for me as well. So Alan Shalsha, Dr. Alan Shalsha, who's now works here at Central uh, at, at, at Community Health here mm-hmm. at Dell Medical School, was my my hall director. Uh, and, you know, Alan had this crazy idea that he was going to assemble this team of RAs that were going to be unlike RAs he had before, diverse oh. RAs, with different perspectives, different viewpoints. And this is like a 20 year old doing yep. this. It's not like he's like a you know fully functional adult. And um, you know, I, I think about it all the time that I built some incredible friendships there. I learned so much from that experience. And similarly, uh, Mrs. Burt, you know, uh Renee Polk, you know, yeah. Marilyn Heimlich, you know, uh, you know, our good friend Sharon Justice, those people poured into me yeah. and saw things. And, you know, uh, Dwight Burns, all these people who were influential who did that for me and the same thing my first year i was on scholastic probation second yeah. semester at ut and i'm applying for jobs as ari and oa because i did not feel i belonged there right. and i figured maybe way to make that happen is to get the place better and glenn maloney rest in power glenn maloney sat me down one day and i was really feeling myself like, oh my god i'm terrible at this and you know you're being told to tell me nice things because it's your job but mm-hmm. i'm really horrible Mm-hmm. And he said, you just need to be connected to this place. He says, you are brilliant. You're going to do brilliant things. And, you know, um, Glenn's influence and people yes. like Glenn is so powerful. So and, powerful. you know, I can't walk in that building without thinking about Glenn and generations of students who just know the Glenn Millennium Room. Oh, that's where you yes. go hang out. I'm like, go look at the plaque. Yes. The picture of Glenn. Know the stories. And just know who, what kind of person he was. Absolutely, oh, and, and and how much how much joy he expressed in all of us. And, and I had a chance to see him before he passed away, and um, it was it was a surprise to me that it was happening. But yeah. nevertheless, just somebody who had spent his entire life truly pouring, pouring into others. Mm-hmm. Well, and so, where his legacy? Oh, absolutely. And I think about you know. Um, you know, you've already shared a lot about your, ex- you know, the experiences, the identities that really, in- that really, in- I'm not going to even say inform, they really inspire, they nurture. It's like the book came to life because all of these love stories, if you will, just kind of yeah. bloomed through <laughs> these stories. Um, and, um, but so I'm going to, I'm going to go into the book a little bit, if that's okay. Yes, um, please there's do. A, there's a point, and, and you've kind of led in with talking about, and, and I know how significant the conversation about mentoring and mentorship uh, is to you. Um, I think we share that in common. Um, and I just love the section where you tell the story about you, aka the dude who has to go to the bathroom. Um, in that section, uh, where you were talking about the, you know, like the notion of a hidden curriculum um, mm-hmm. and the role of mentoring, particularly across different identities and lived experiences. But you talk about mentoring, but then you have this phrase or this word, mentorability. Um, and so I'd love to hear about the story um, and this notion of mentorability as an elevation of mentoring and what you mean by that. I love that story. And I was actually, I actually was out um, on the South Mall, not far from Garrison Hall. <laughs> and I, it always goes through my mind at some point in time. You know, folks, if you ever have the opportunity to go back to the institution that you were educated at and work there, you should do it because you'll have constant memories of things you did years ago. So um, what Mont is alluding to is that uh, I went to inner city high school here in Austin, Texas, and I was a good student, but my school had pretty strict rules about egress and, you know, leaving classes and what have you, right? Yeah, the pass, go to the restroom, that kind of stuff like that. And, you know, I kind of thought, you know, college was 13th grade with more homework, right? Uh, and so I, I, I went to class one day after lunch. I had this history class right after lunch period, had a huge big gulp or something. And of course, had not taken a biological break. And of course, halfway through the class, the need is, is there. And I was sitting in the middle of the class. So not in the edges in the periphery, but it's one of those lecture style classrooms where you're like smack in the middle of the classroom. So there's no way to subtly get out of this classroom. And if I had been on the periphery, I would have probably slid out quietly. 
So I'm like, I'm going to get up in those person's lecture. They're going to stop their lecture and ask what I'm doing. So I better secure permission first. So I raise my hand. And my professor is in full lecture mode. So she sees me and keeps on going. And I'm like, well, the urge is getting more, more and more desperate. So I'm like, ah! and she's like, yes, what is it? And I'm like, can I go to the restroom? And she's like, go, what are you asking me for? And, you know, kind of incredulous. And of course I walk out, and, you know, like that's my, this hundred group of stu hundred students are like, yeah, that's the guy who went to the bathroom. But it goes to show you, like, nobody's ever told me, like, okay, in the college setting, you just get up and go if you need to. You try to be inconspicuous. You try not to make a whole lot of racket. But that's a difference that hadn't been explained to me. And there's no really way to know that. So I'm reminded of the work that Tony Jack has done, The Privileged Poor. And Tony's really good about talking about transparency and explaining things. So I still to this day tell my students, you know, I walk through things like that. What do you call me, you know? You can call me Dr. Red, you can call me Dr. Rich, you can call me, you know, you, you, I give them all those kind of things because I want them to know things. And I also want them to know that if you have to go to the restroom or you have to come to class late, here's how you handle it. And I'm sure for a lot of students, it's like, why is he telling us this stuff? We already know this. But there are some students in the classroom who don't. And Monta, one thing I've learned in the 17 years I've been teaching at the university is like every time you say something that shows vulnerability yeah. or shows uh, that you didn't know what was going on at all points in time, somebody in that room needs to hear you say that. Absolutely. Either they thought you were on the super high level or they actually needed to know that information themselves. Yes. Um, and I'm always amazed about the most innocuous things that you drop in conversation end up being, it's, it's not usually like the lecture you give them about, you know, being an independent scholar or it's, it's usually like the things you say about like, yeah, today I came to work and, you know, my son's, you know, he's practicing to play basketball. And it's, you know, it's hard to juggle all the things in life. And they're like, well, I'm doing that too, right? Yes. Well, it's I, I have student parents. Yeah, you're you're yeah. dropping artifacts of humanity, right? And people need exactly. to see those artifacts. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, it, and it really is about um, sort of expressing one's humanity, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, and you asked about mentorability. So um, I was asked to give a talk at, um, at the ASH, a CEP uh, conference one, and David Perez the second shout out to David he's an amazing guy reached out to me and David's one of the guys who was young when I was you know I was like oh that guy's gonna be great when he gets out of grad school and he got out of grad school he got a professorship and uh he reaches out and he says we want you to be the keynote I'm like that's awesome what am I going to talk about <laughs> <laughs> um and I'd already had this uh, agenda on mentoring and I unlike a lot of people who do mentoring research had focused on mentors as a right. population, right? Not necessarily the mentees. I knew the mentees were getting good things out of it, but I want to talk to the mentors. Like, why do you do the work? Especially across racial, gender, identity uh, lines. And one thing I had kind of started to realize is that people were coming to me and saying things like, we're doing all this mentoring work and we're not getting the response from the mentee group. Uh -huh. And I thought to myself, well, you know, who's talking to the mentees about how to access this knowledge, this experience, because it's intimidating, right? When you have somebody who's achieved so much and you are a person who reveres education and somebody who's very educated comes to you and says, I'm here to help. You're not going to run to them and say, help me. You might, but a lot of people are like, I don't want to bother that person. I don't want right. to annoy them. I don't exactly. want to make them look I'm not smart. And, and so I started talking with Laura Struby, who was my student at the time, about this idea. And we wrote a white paper on mentorability. And basically the idea is, you know, you have coachability. You know, right. Is that person able to be coached? Mentorability, is that person able to accept and understand? And, and at first it was like, I'm trying to help the mentors here. But right. then it became, actually, how do we empower mentees to right. access the hidden curriculum through their mentors? And, you know, we had these steps that we had thought about. And a few years later, maybe a year or two later, I'm either at an info session and I met Vic Victoria Black. Victoria Black works at Texas State. She says, I want to get my doctorate at UT and I am fascinated by your mentorability concept. And I'm like, <laughs> you found that? You know? Mm -hmm. And uh, she and Zach Taylor, one of my other students, really got into this work and started kind of expanding the concept. Like, how do we really help folks who yeah. are starting their journeys to understand? Because a lot of times what happens, Mom, is you have a situation where we've kind of decided that mentoring is the panacea. It'll fix everything, right?
right? Yes. So we give students multiple mentors. Yes. And the student is like, how do I what do you do use with that? these people? Yes. And I don't want to bother them. All these different things come up. And so we have to sort of help help shape that experience and also explain things like reciprocity. Because the thing right. I learned probably most significantly from being a mentor researcher is that mentors were almost always leaning conspiratorially at some point in the interview to say, if I'm having as much fun and getting as much out of this as my mentee, is that okay? And I'm like, that's kind of the point, actually. Yes, you know, absolutely. It should not feel like you're pouring into somebody. It should be feeling like you're getting poured into at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we were able to do with that work, and I want to shout out Victoria because she did this amazing TED Talk on it. And it's cited in the book. I want people to take a look at it. Uh, but she really breaks down the components of it and how she uses her work at Texas State University. Uh, and so I'm just, um, it's overjoying to see something like that, which is an idea you had and sort of having some people help you with the idea and then seeing somebody really take it to the next level. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, mentorability is something I lean on constantly when I think about my own journey because, yes. you know, people will often assume that, oh, you're of a certain age and certain position. Clearly you have accomplished all you need to accomplish. Well, no, I look to people like you. I look to my peers as mentors and I need to understand how to access all that you know. I mean, as you know, I actually access you and your expertise in our ability confronting racism seminar at Harvard. You speak in that program and that's because I want to learn from you and have my students learn from you as well. So um, that reciprocity idea is really important to the concept of mentor ability and also to sort of prevent the idea of mentor fatigue, which is when you just, yeah. the solution is mentoring. And you're like, I have 10 mentors. It's too much, right? Versus I have understood the concept of constellation mentoring. And I can act as Mopta for some things and Rich for other things. Yes. And it's actually something they enjoy and they want to do. So I'm actually helping them in some ways. Well, it actually connects so many other concepts in your book, right? So, I mean, there's a, uh, and I don't know where we, you, you can decide where we go is to choose your own adventure experience here. But, you know, um, I, I feel like there there's a, this notion of mentorship that really connects um, some of the other concepts. So um, in some ways, um, when you talk about cultural taxation in the book, uh, men mentoring, um, the act of having to mentor so many populations could be experiences cultural taxation, right? I mean, if, if there is a, a undue burden on a certain population in a way that there may not be on other populations, possibly. Um, and then when you talk about the way by which we can shift that, um, I love that you bring up um, um, Tervalon and Murray Garcia's uh, work on cultural humility, right? I mean, that's, that's one of my yeah. favorite um, principles as well, that by using principles of cultural humility th that actually infuses life like yeah. it's it's almost a counterweight to to cultural taxation in many ways and it allows us to think about cross identity mentorship right it, it allows us to open possibilities to um hold on to one another rather than say oh you're of shared identity so you're going to do all the mentorship in this way it allows us to enter it allows us to think about our privileged identities and say okay how can i be a bridge so I, I just I think the the counterweighting of cultural taxation and cultural humility. I don't know if you meant it that way, that way or not. But but it knowing those terms, you just uh, it unlocked something different for me. Um, when that's I was... that's so great to hear. Yeah, I I think about that in so many ways because obviously I'm a product of incredible cross identity mentoring experiences. Uh, I've had simply amazing. Uh, you know, homophilus mentors. So yeah. Charles Willie, who, you know, was probably my greatest academic mentor I've ever had, uh, wrote together, published together, became part of his family, you know, those different things like that. Um, you know, Gregory Vincent, you know, I talked to I talked to Greg yesterday, you know, somebody who really has been and showed up in my life so many times to support and, and advance my career. Um, but the list of people cross identity is is much longer. You know, mm -hmm. it's the Brenda Burks and the Sharon Justices, mm -hmm. the Vivian Louis and all these other people, the Carol Hovlins, these people who had such different identities from mine. Mm -hmm. But the same idea, what I really care about you and I see something in you right. worth advancing. And you don't see it yourself, but I see it. Mm -hmm. And you don't believe me when I'm telling you this, but it's true. 
Yes. And at some point you do recognize and you're like, thank you for that. And they say, yeah. well, how could I not? Right. And I, of course, I had experience of that happening myself. I have students tell me all the time. I have no idea why you care so much that I do this thing right. or get involved in this thing because I see it. Yes. You know? I see it in you. And, and, and I'm happy to help facilitate that blossoming. So, yeah, the cultural taxation piece, and I have a piece I wrote a couple of years ago with a couple of my colleagues called Cultural Taxation Without Representation. Yes. Because most people who experience cultural taxation will say it is something that I am invested in doing. I care about my community. I want this to happen. I'm often here because of the fact that people poured into right. me. So I want to do the same thing for others. However, it's the issue of recognition and, yes. and compensation that matters. And um, if it's going to happen, if you're at an institution that is 90%, let's just suppose, insert gender, 90% male, and you're one of the 10% of women on the campus, well, guess what? You're going to end up seeing a lot of the traffic about women looking for mentorship, right? right. Um, but at the same time, the question becomes, are you able to integrate that into your work and the things that you do so you are actually given the same uh, sort of allowances to make the time for it and also advance your career. So what we end up seeing a lot of times with cultural taxation, when it comes time to promotion, when it comes time for uh, tenure granting, mm -hmm. that person doesn't have enough because they've been doing this other right. invisible, uncompensated work. And uncompensation to me is not just financial, even though financial is, is very nice. Um, it's, it's also recognition and saying this actually matters. And I've been around long enough to say I do think that there is something to be said in the academy, at least, and certainly in the student affairs field, uh, that there is an allowance and an importance of yep. doing that kind of work, right? Absolutely. And there's ways to accrue uh, recognition and, and notoriety to doing that work. And of course, the, the cultural humility piece is the fact that I'm able to learn and able to grow. And I don't have to assume, because a lot of times people don't understand that you know, I'm a white cisgender male, you know, who's successful. And there's a, a Latina, you know, queer woman in my space that maybe I think is really strong, but I couldn't possibly have anything to give to her, right? Because mm -hmm. culturally, you don't understand the importance of sharing, or maybe that person yes. that you're trying to help is going to help you, right? Yes. You're going to grow from that experience. Yeah. You're going to accrue some understanding experience. And in fact, Another concept, of course, is about the idea of the privilege payoff, right? Yep. So if the cultural taxation is a subtraction of time uh, and lack of recognition, the folks who aren't doing that work are advantaged in some ways. And that can end up with things where you have this massive uh, sort of difference in the service loads. And I saw this a lot myself when I would look in my own experience about right. my colleagues who were doing amazing mentoring, supporting nurturing, academic housekeeping work. And we had superstar faculty who were doing all these amazing things, but perhaps were not doing as much as that. But they were getting all the rewards. Right. And, and the people doing the work were getting nothing. That's why I say it's a, it's a payoff. It's a tax shelter, right? So, you know, just first of all, naming the fact that your input and your engagement is needed, right? Uh -huh. uh, yeah. And my colleague, Mark Smith, who used to be the dean of the graduate school here at UT Austin, had a great way of talking about older white males as catalysts, right? He's, a, yeah. he's an engineer. This means something to them, right? And, and the idea that, you know, older white men, because of the societal power they wield, if they elect to engage and apply that power in certain ways, they provide opportunities for other folks who have been marginalized to have the ability to speak right. out or to amplify their voices in some ways. And, and a lot of times it's like, I don't know, I could do that. Yes, you can. Yeah. And sometimes just being aware of the fact that that exists is important and part of privilege is the normalization of that process, right? Yeah. When you make it plain, it's like, I didn't realize that was happening. That's often the response I get from people when they hear this, like, I didn't realize that was a thing, but now I'm thinking about it. Now I do see how it's been happening yeah. and I want to be part of the solution. And right. a part of the solution is using that the privilege payoff in ways that give people access uh, to systems of, of power, but also to question the system itself, right? It, that's right. another part of it too. We don't want to just simply be accommodating a system that's problematic. Right. We want to actually challenge it as well. But I also think that we have to think about pragmatically, if we're in institutions, 
we have likely bought into some variant of how the system is operating. Right. So the idea of burning it all down and starting again is probably not going to happen in our context. Right. So we have to think about being, you know, as Deborah Marsden says, tempered radicals. How yes. do we do that work in a way that allows us to actually prosper, but still have credibility in the institutional context and to move all of the folks in the institutional uh, experience yeah. at the same time versus, you know, really, really um, maybe doing something very specific <laughs> for one community and leaving a bunch of folks behind. Absolutely. And, you know, I really, um, it was really healing and restorative to have a phrase for, I think, um, gives meaning to components of my journey, um, the, the notion of tempered radical, um, because um, I think, and you remember, um, kind of in my own evolution from from us as peers when we were younger to, you know, that being the career and the way that I showed up, the way that I showed up in, in my early career as a multicultural affairs professional, kind of with a different way of being vocal and a different way of raising voice um, and issues. And that that person in me around the recognition of ways that things need to change, that person's always going to be there. But how, how do I find you know, during different iterations of my career, how do I find ways to be present um, and still um, show up in a way that's thoughtful and caring to be able to create an environment where everyone gets to feel whole and everyone gets to feel connected. So that that phrase um, really captured a lot for me as well. So I really appreciated reading about that. And and so much in your in your book, right? So um, it's it's just a beaut. I mean, it, it's it, of course it is narrative text. Um, and in some ways, there is something so autobiographical and autoethnographic about how you've written this. Um, and yet there is the integration of storytelling. Well, I guess that's the autoethnographic component of it. But um, there's the honoring of our academic elders and so many other and our peers. Um, there is also I feel like I got, I got a lot of takeaway lessons about what it really means that on the one hand, I didn't find that you you asked me to do something that was heavy. Mm, yeah. um, and yet I found the ability to handle heaviness and to be mm. in the heaviness um, while reading your book. And so I, I just, uh, how did you write with this tone of, I'm calling it balanced hope. I don't have another phrase for That's it. That's a great phrase. I love that. Yeah. But, but you were able to address heaviness fearlessly mm. You didn't, you know, there is not a hiding behind that, but it, there's a, a seriousness and a balanced hope through it. How, I'm just curious how you were able to do that. Well, thank you, first of all. It's very kind of you to say. And, and, you know, I have to go back and credit my editor, Jane Pardinoli. And uh, Jane and I have been, we became fast friends when I was doing, I was actually reviewing manuscripts for Harvard Ed Press. Um, and we had a meeting in 2019 in Portland. It was at Ash. And she said to me, when are we going to get a copy? When are we going to get your book proposal? When are you proposing a book for you to write? And I had written, you know, co-authored books with Dr. Willie. So I had experience of writing books as a colleague or as, as a part of a research team I've done before. And, and I really was like, well, I do mentoring stuff. Got a DEI stuff I do. Doing some op-eds. Like, how does that all fit together? And you know, she said to me, like, you don't have to think about it right now, the second, but just planting a seed. And that seed definitely took, and I was able to call her and sort of ask ideas. And she's like, eh, I don't know if that's really something, <laughs> you know, kind of gently coached me to other things. And finally, I kind of said, you know, there are a lot of great books that really delve into the meat and potato. Sarah Ackman's book, you yes. know, there's so many, Amazing. Carson Bird, uh, Julie Park, so many people have written amazing books, uh, you know, Julie Cassell, you know, there, there's this great books been written about sort of how we engage in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but I want to write a book that's maybe oriented to a different audience. And, and honestly, um, sort of my role model was Beverly Day and Tatum. Mm -hmm. And when I was in college, I read Why Are All the Black yeah. Kids Singing in the Cafeteria? And as a psychologist, she was writing in a very accessible way for yes. non-psychologists. And I'm like, I don't know if I'd be able to do that, right? Because that's what I, I want to write to an audience. And that's been my my goal all throughout my career, Mopta. I've never mm -hmm. 
you know, I like the idea of talking to people in right. my scholarly space, but I want people outside my space to read my work. It's part of my first gen identity is I, I want my parents to read my work. Right? Yes. I want people outside of the field of education, outside of academia to read what I write. And it's hard because typically when we write stuff, it ends up in journals or ends up in academic yes. you know, spaces. And so part of me doing public scholarship through op-eds and those kinds of things was to find those voices. And I also love the fact that when I did that, I would hear from people. And mm -hmm. yes, you have trolls, but more often than not, my engagement with the public was usually really positive. Somebody saying, Here's something that I learned from the, what you wrote, or here's something you should be involved in or know about. This is happening as well. And sometimes I think you're wrong about this, but you yeah. know, I like the fact you, you right. told me how you thought. Those were all really beneficial things for me. And so I kind of said, I want to write a book like that. And you know, when I used uh, Tatum's book as sort of, this is what I'm trying to accomplish, the reviewers got it. They're like, okay, we get that. And there is a need for that. They were like, there is a need for a book that takes people from a place of, hey, this is something I'm dealing with at my job or something I'm interested in. But, you know, the work that we've been doing, you've done so much and, and been so uh, such, a, such a leader in, it can be uh, intimidating to people who are new to it. Uh, it can, there is sometimes very much a feeling of insider outsider, right? you know, uh, and I wanted to sort of see if I could overcome that in the sense that I am very much embedded in the academic world but I wanted to step outside that world. And I, I've had the most fun. I was at a Montessori school, Montessori for all set for them. And I, I gave a, a keynote at their conference. Huh. And I'm like, you know, I didn't write this with Montessori school leaders in mind, but I think it fits your work very well. Yes. Because it's about uh, courageous leadership in a space and dealing with all the challenges it takes to lead with the sort of headwinds that we have. And um, it was also fun to write. I mean, you know, when you when you write, you're it's it becomes a task, right? I, I, right. It's like I me. Mean, I'm a frustrated rock star, as you know, and right. I have my bass guitar, and I'm like, you know, I love <laughs> you know playing along. Right. At a certain point, you realize when Sting's out there doing his thing, or Faith and More out there doing their thing, that's their job. Yeah. It's probably as fun for them as what you think it is. And, and, and writing is can be the same way. But there were moments where I really felt like this is clicking now. And there's also moments in the process where I'm like this is clunky and makes no sense. And I don't think it will actually connect in any way. And I had just to get used to the rhythms of that. And, you know, as somebody who writes professionally, um, somebody like Mary Beth Gassman, who wrote the blur for my book and is amazing and a role model of mine. She writes as a discipline, as a practice. That is not how I write. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I write a necessity. Mm -hmm. So I'll sit there with a blank page or nothing. And all of a sudden I'm like, I get, get words on the page and I'll do it. But just that process and also almost personalizing it. Like I'm talking to Monta. I'm mm -hmm. talking to Mrs. Burke. I'm talking to people I know in the field or people who I don't know. Yeah. How do I want them to feel about this kind of stuff? And also not insult their intelligence, right. but also make sure I don't leave them hanging. Like the Vygotskyan proximal zone of development. How do I get to that exact spot? So I hope I got there. And I think I left enough breadcrumbs for folks that if I was a little bit out of depth, I can get people back when you go. If it was a little bit basic, skip that part and read on. Right? Yeah, I, I really, <laughs> um, I know there's a point in where you kind of guide the reader or, I, I mean, I felt like it was a conversation when I was reading it where I was like, oh, wow, like Rich is talking to me here. And I, I know you, so I can hear your voice. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, but there's a point like early on the book where you're like, this is how I think you should read this book. And you said, I think you said something like, I guess if you want to read it in one sitting, I I couldn't put it down. I, I did read it. <laughs> I actually did read it in one sitting and I didn't require a beverage um, to do that. Um, but what I really appreciate is there, there certainly for the things that I was able to follow. Yeah. I have a, I carry a lot of privilege and access to information, right. Going through the academic journeys that I have. So I want to own that. Um, and there were certainly a lot of things that I certainly may not um, concepts that may have been adjacent to what I knew, but didn't. Right. And, and for that, there was enough references for me to say, okay, Note to self, I'm going to, I'm going to look more into that concept. I'm going to look more into this concept. And so I really, really value mm -hmm. that. Um, and it, I think it takes me to, and I think this, uh, you know, as we kind of close out our conversation, um, I find that as I have grown more seasoned in my own roles and identities, um, there was a point in my career and I still feel it like it's never going to go away, but this idea of having to get it right, 
having to get it yeah. right. And I think that that's actually also a manifestation of somewhat of a privileged identity. Like, so I, I'm afraid to make mistakes because I don't want to offend people. Right. And I wonder how much of us, how many of us um, don't step into our courage because to make the mistake would mean to offend, which means to hurt, which means to be held publicly accountable. Right. There, there is that whole cycle that ha an accountability cycle and, and it hurt, we're human. It hurts. Um, and it's part of the journey, right? So mm -hmm. not attaching a value laden component to it, but it, it's, it's there, right? I've experienced that as I've been held accountable by students as a senior administrator. Um, yeah. and they are engaging in their freedom of expression. And I should actually lift that up and cherish that, right? Like that's separate from what I might be experiencing and really honor that as well. But you use this, I love the roller skating metaphor. Um, that you use. I'd love to hear you kind of talk about that and um, share with the audience. I just, I just love the way you kind of frame the end yeah. for us to stay present. Well, you know, Catherine, my 13 year old um, has, I think, and, and been a very good sport about this. So I didn't tell her I was going to do this, but when I was trying to think about an analogy about how to engage in this challenging work, you know, and like you said, the fears that we have about, you know, I'm going to go and, you know, engage with a student population or population of folks that I'm not necessarily a part of, that I feel allyship towards or co conspiratory uh, connections to, but I don't know how I'm going to come across. I might actually get it wrong. I might say something that's not really uh, the right way. It, all those kinds of things that really limit our ability to engage authentically. And, you know, the one thing I can tell people is that, uh, you know, I have a lot of shortcomings, but one of them is not authenticity. You know, I am who I am. Yeah. Um, and and so, you know, when I come to people and say, I'm honestly trying to help and maybe I'm not helping the right ways. Maybe I need more guidance on how to help better. And I know it's responsibly for my own growth in that process, right. but I am honestly here to help or I'm honestly here to empathize and support. Mm -hmm. I have found if that's the approach I take, I usually get a very good response. And it means I have to also take the responsibility of learning oh, and accepting the fact that I won't get it right all the time. And as academics, I think we tend to be in spaces where expertise is privileged and we mm -hmm. like people to be experts. We don't want people to struggle with things, but that's how you learn, you mm -hmm. struggle. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I thought about teaching uh, both my kids to skate, both Carl and Catherine. Um, but for whatever reason, I think Catherine seemed to be more hesitant and she was doing the shuffling thing you know mm -hmm. and i'm like well you know you got to kind of stride to skate it's, that's how it works and at some point i said to her i said you know are you afraid of falling and she's like yeah <laughs> falling hurts i'm like good point it does hurt i said but what if we found a way to fall safe right what if i taught you how to fall because you're going to fall falling is absolutely part of being a skater right professional skaters do it Ice skaters do it. They all fall. So if you learn how to fall safely, I'll bet you you'll be more successful in the skating. Of course, um, like last week, hey, can we go to the can we go to Playland? Of course. And they're out there for hours skating and going backwards. I can't do that. Stuff like that. And, and so what I loved about that was just the fearlessness uh, because she accepted the fact like falling is part of the game. I'm just going to deal with it. Um, and I think a lot of times you, you just mentioned it, Mopta, we, we often say, well, this possibility could happen. And look, you and I have yeah. been in situations that have not been pleasant, right? No. Yeah. And we have fallen maybe unsafely, but we also had a community of people around us to say, we got your back and we know who you are. So maybe that interaction in that space did not go the way you wanted it to go, but you have credibility in the space or you're building credibility in the space right. or you're an honest authentic you know broker and that'll buy you some space but you want we often think about people being monoliths like right. everybody in this community thinks i'm terrible well maybe some people do yeah but more often than not you're going to probably find some people who are like you know i'm halfway there with you yeah. i i think i see what you're trying to do and i think about my emergence as a feminist and how i was fortunate to have uh women mentors who were yeah. tolerant of my inadequacies and supported me and help me learn things like patriarchy and things like oppression that I didn't necessarily understand at the time, but they took time with me. And everybody has that time. And also empathizing with people who are in those spaces who may be like, you know what? I am going through so much pain right now. I can't attend to your shortcomings. I just can't. Right. 
and understand that's part of the process. And, and so almost depersonalizing it and saying it's opportunity for growth. When I go in those spaces, I always say to myself, okay, chance for me to grow. How can I grow from this? And sometimes that person seemed to have a really bad day and really not be happy with me for some reason that seemed a little extra from what was actually coming from me. But there's still things for me to learn about how I present things or even how I take feedback well, I or how of, I engage. Yeah, well, I think so. What's interesting about what you're saying, and I love the balance, right? So yeah, we've had people with, um, I'm going to say people with differing identities, subordinate identities, where, where the, they experience the cultural taxation and pouring into us, if I can mm -hmm. use that for, for a moment. And yeah. we may be lucky to have people that pour into us. And we uh, obviously should show up in a space of gratitude and, and continue to do our own self-work in a way that you say, but we're not entitled. We're not entitled to people pouring into us. So if somebody offers us a disparate response, you know, that that's also okay. Like that is absolutely okay and well within their right in their journey. And our job is to be able to say, ah, oh, I, that, that was a, I fell skating there. That's not about, that's not about anything negative about that mm -hmm. person. That's, oh, that's an invitation. There's more work that I need to do. And, you know, like that, that shouldn't be a discouraging. I think sometimes that can feel right. That's an ouch moment in, in, in a singular way, but that's also the invitation to say, get back up and try again, right? Get back up yep. and try again. And and so I really value, like, I think it's being in the messiness. Um, there, there isn't, like, this is not going to yeah. be human. Human, humanity is messy in the sense that we're complex. We have lots of things happening. There's lots of cross-cutting, uh, you know, sort of things that are happening. And, and then you add on the context of world events. Right now we're going through some truly horrifying things that are happening in Israel and Gaza. And, you know, the temptation to simplify and say, oh, well, you know, I have empathy and sympathy for people on this side of the issue and not for those on this side is 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 tempting. Right. And we're seeing this happening in our institutions right now. The reality is, is that I, I just think, like you said, we have to have courage to to know that if we are authentically existing in this in this world, um, our authentic concerns will be heard. I, I sent a message to my community saying, you know, I know that so many of you are impacted by this very directly and my heart pours out to you. Uh, I'm so sorry you're experiencing these things. And for many of us, we are direct, we are impacted indirectly in the sense that we have friends or we have mm. people close to us, or it triggers something in our own experiences that seems very similar. Mm. And to just sort of say that, that I see you and I appreciate that, and I'm going to stay in the space with you, yeah. right? Not checking the box to say, I sent you a letter. Good, I'm done. Um, right. That's so important. And I had a great conversation with colleagues today about that. We talked about like, what's the right approach? And the right approach to me seems to be authentic and honest and empathetic and humble. If you're doing those things, I think that's how you get to the point. And also know that despite all those things, you may still hit the wrong tone. And being open to that and right. knowing that somebody in the space will say, well, it might have been helpful for those people, but not for me. Yeah. And then hearing what you could do to be better about that. And, and just understanding that we're human beings. And, and, you know, sometimes we say this very glibly, we can't make everybody happy. I, I think of it the other way around. Um, try to maximize the joy and happiness oh, and restoration right. you can do for others, yeah. right? Knowing yeah. that you may not be successful in all those events. Well, and I also, you know, as I hear you talk, something um, comes up for me. I think I find when I'm in a position, particularly in a leadership role, and I, I'm not saying that there aren't rights and wrongs. I guess what I'm saying, when I am fixated on my behaviors in terms of, am I being perceived as right or wrong, then I center yeah. me yeah. and I'm not centering the people that I should be caring about. So this isn't about pursuit of right or wrong. Like, I don't want to get into that conversation necessarily. But if I'm right. more fixated about how people see me, as opposed to how I am being, like my role and responsibility is to be present and humble, um, no matter kind of what the residual impacts or outcomes of, of that may be, of course, we all have a right to kind of, you know, step in and step out. You know, I, th I think that you, you bring up self-care quite a lot in the book as well. Um, self-care, particularly in our marginalized identities, is important. But but this idea, I, I think there's a full presence, I think, that you invite us to be fully present um, as an alternative yeah. to to going into fix-it mode. 
Yeah. And, and you know, we are looked to yeah. sometimes do those things, right? That's sometimes the expectation that we're supposed to fix things, right? And that's when people lose sight of the fact that we are, in fact, human beings, too, right? We have to sort of make sense of that. And and so part of the responsibility of being a yes, leader is like, you do have responsibility to, you know, to give some shape or fashion of, yeah. of what we're trying to accomplish. But I love what you said about, hey, almost decentering your, ourselves as, you know, what are we being perceived as and more about how can I be the best help in the situation? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means I need to be reflective and say less and listen more. And sometimes it means I need to say something in this moment. That's true. Um, whatever the consequences may be. But also, I need to say something that will allow me to remain in the space to support people. If you say Absolutely. something that's really needed to be said, and it ends up with you no longer being in that space at the end of the whole process, mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. you know, that might not have been the exact thing that was needed at the moment. Right. So, you know, I think it's a very delicate balance. But you know, it, it's so important that we, you know, think about our students holistically. And I, yes. you know, there's a Peter Gomes. Peter Gomes was the yes. chaplain at Harvard for many years. You know, students are more than brains on a stick, right? Yes. You know, student affairs professionals are more than brains on a stick, right? We we all have complete, yes. full lives that need to be understood, appreciated, recognized, acknowledged. And I think when you do that, mm -hmm. then you're able to sort of understand the world in a more um vivid way and then yeah. you can also lead to other people's understandings as well and i i just feel you know obviously every day and i have this concern if i say something i'll be misperceived i don't want to be the impact so i'm concerned about how people feel about what i say right, exactly. but ultimately to your point if i let that go and say i just need to be authentically honest and tell people that i'm standing alongside them in the struggle Mm -hmm. then I think you're generally going to be somewhere in the universe of getting it where you need to be right. And if you're not, you know, it's not because you were focused on the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And um, let us all have the privilege of, of failing, you know, yeah. forward, right? Failing, forward. failing in the sense that we learn something from the things that we've done this time, we get applied to the next environment. Mm -hmm. And it's just a key point to me to think about how in this particular point in time, how important it is for us to see our friends and people who aren't our friends yeah. in their entirety, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, last last question, and um, it's going to be hard. I'm going to ask you to keep it brief. If you had oh, a geez. wish, you had a, yeah. If you had a wish for for the readers, for the people that ha that have the opportunity and gift to read your book, what is your hope for those readers? I actually think that's not hard for me because it's it's that it will spur you to talk to somebody else about what you read, right? Um, and it's already happened. I mean, ultimately, that's the that's the ultimate benefit to an author. Like something you read that I wrote inspired you to say to somebody, "I read this thing. What do you think? Oh, that's crap." Or, "Oh, that's really interesting. I should read that too." And mm -hmm. again, back to my public scholarship identity. That's something that I really relish when somebody said to me, hey, I read your op-ed and it started a discussion with me and a coworker. We realized we hadn't talked about this issue for a long period of time. That is like the best thing you can ever hear. Like, mm -hmm. I just wanted to spark a conversation. And we're in a space where I think there are too many conversations happening with folks who think very similarly. Yes. And that's great. We need those conversations. But how many times are we talking with folks who think differently than us? Mm -hmm. uh, and you and I are from a generation where we thought that was a good thing, right? Yeah. It's good to engage with people who have different ideas. It's good to engage people who disagree, right? How do we reclaim that space of thoughtful engagement with other ideas? And, and also at the same time, feel supported in our work. Right. I'm really fixated right now with some Claude Steele. And Claude Steele talks a lot about free speech, juxtaposed with the importance of making sure that people who have been historically marginalized do not feel exploited or have their um, fragility of their experiences yes. dismissed because of free speech. Absolutely. It's delicate. So, um, you know, if, if, you know, it's like a gateway book, I hope people say, hey, yes. you should read this, right? And maybe get somebody who thinks differently to take a look at it and see if the arguments make sense to them or not. And what's the critique? What do they think is wrong with the ideas? You know, is there something in there they see a connection to? Because I think we all function better when we're like, you know, I'm not 100% there with you. But I see how you get to this point. And right. that's 
good enough for me. And I honestly think um, what's going to make our experiences so much better going forward is the ability to engage in those difficult discourses okay. that maybe put us in different spaces, but don't shut off our dial. Yeah. And, and in an interesting way, that invitation is a form of restorative resistance, right? So I think um, it doesn't yeah. feel like it, right? But but you're you're normalizing um, re- for us to be present. We can be restorative and resistant at the same time. And yep. um, I really, really value that. Well, Rich, I could talk to you for days, as you already know. Yes. Um, yes. I'm so grateful to you for your time, for your spirit, your energy today as a guest on Student Affairs Now. Um, I also want to take this moment to thank our sponsor, Simplicity. Again, we, ap- we really appreciate your support. Simplicity is the global leader in student services technology platforms with the -the state-of-the-art technology that empowers institutions to make data-driven decisions specific to their goals. A true partner to the institutions, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life, including but not limited to career services and development, student conduct and well-being, student success, and accessibility services. To learn more, visit simplicity.com or connect with Simplicity on Facebook, X, and LinkedIn. Much love and such a huge shout out to our colleague, Nat Ambrosi, who is the producer for the podcast, um, who does all the behind the scenes work to make us look good and sound good. Um, If you're listening today and not already receiving our weekly newsletter, please visit our website at studentaffairsnow.com and scroll down to the bottom of the homepage to add your email to our MailChimp list. While you're there, check out our archives. Um, Again, my friends, This is Mumta Akapati. Much love and gratitude to everyone who's watching or listening. Please make it a beautiful week that honors your soul, spirit, and ancestral wisdom. Thank you very much.